Coming up on Car Advice, lightning performance, accelerating dynamics, and everyday drivability, would you buy the Hyundai i30N, the Renault Megane RS, or the Volkswagen Golf GTI if you had $50,000 to spend? Go big or go home. We put the mighty Ram 1500 to work in the ultimate heavy duty tow test. And manufacturing warranties. How close to the sun can you fly with performance upgrades? Welcome to Car Advice, I'm Trent Nikolic. Thank you for joining us. Another big week in automotive and we will take a look at performance hatches. We're gonna put the Hyundai i30N against the Renault Megane and Volkswagen Golf GTI in a proper hot hatch mega test. We'll take a look at the Ram 1500. Uh, we're gonna put it to work and we're gonna have a look at whether you should be stepping up from a conventional dual cab ute to a bigger American pickup truck and performance upgrades. The question is whether they affect your warranty. We need to understand the impact that they have on your consumer warranty. Joining me at the desk, Car Advice Senior Road Tester, Paul Merrick. Good evening, mate. Hello. Tonight Thank seems to be all about, is bigger better? Yeah, that's exactly right, yeah. Well, you and I have put on weight, so yeah, why not? <laughs> Absolutely, we might as well look at that. First up, let's take a look at BMW 3 Series pricing and specs. Now, first off, uh, it's gonna start from 67,900 bucks, so just under 68 grand. The point to make here, I think, before we get into this a little deeper is, in Australia, X models outsell passenger cars yep. uh, for BMW because we're SUV crazy. But the 3 Series is their most popular car globally. So this is a huge deal, this car. And it's set to continue because, have a look at that. It looks good, oh, doesn't it? It looks stunning. Really it's like good. a small version of the 5 Series, and that is never a bad thing. Uh, so the entry level gets you into the diesel model, yep. which is uh, the 320D. That's it. Four and a half litres per hundred kilometres. Mm. I mean, diesels have really just hit it for six now yeah. in terms of fuel economy. Mm. But the problem now is that efficient petrols mm. are really kicking it too. They so are. the 330i is $70,000. It's only three, three or four grand more. And it's at 6.4 litres yeah. per hundred k's. It's quicker as well. I mean, it's, it's really, for me, a no-brainer. I'd just be going with petrol. You would. And I'm just having a quick look through the standard equipment. You know, for the base level car, you've got things like adaptive LED headlights, yeah. uh, auto high beam, LED fog lights, M Sport package driving assistant package, which is all of the electronic safety yeah. stuff like lane departure warning. This is a good value vehicle. It yeah, really it is. is. It is, and you know, the, the C-Class I reckon has dated mm. just a little bit too much. This um, looks really contemporary. Yeah, even the, the previous generation 3 Series still look quite good. This I think will hold, hold its design nicely over the years to come, but I'm hoping it's not an all wheel drive. And can these sedans get people out of SUVs? That's the question. <laughs> Kia Cerato was recently given an ANCAP rating, and we've had this happen before with other models, but there's a little bit of confusion because it's what we call a split ANCAP safety rating. Uh, and it's important for consumers to understand that we saw it with Stinger, mm. and, and we bought one at Car Advice, yeah. we saw it with Stinger. With Cerato, we're seeing this split result. Consumers need to understand that the same vehicle might not necessarily have the same crash rating from one specification grade to another. So this is a little bit confusing. So yep. when they crash a car, it's not just about how it performs in a crash test. That's right. Nowadays, with all the safety systems that are coming into play with AEB, that's the technology that stops a car if you don't, stands for autonomous emergency braking. Some of the systems differ from each other. Some work up to a certain speed. Some include what they call vulnerable road users, such as pedestrians and cyclists. And as a result of that, you're starting to get these mixed ratings. So with the new Serato range, both hatch and sedan, the S and the Sport grades only score four stars. But then the Sport Plus and the GT, they score five stars. Yep. Now, technically, they score the same when they crash. So the body structure is the same. They both score really well there. It's just these safety systems because one is a camera-only setup that doesn't recognise those users. So it's a bit confusing, isn't it? Yeah, it is really confusing. And, and the, we've tried to you know, dispel some of these confusions with ANCAP before because there's a lot to be said for the fact that you know, a car might miss out on a five-star rating because mm. it's missing a seatbelt warning light or something really minor like that in the middle position in the second row. And you as a consumer could be thinking, well, I don't put five people yeah. in the car anyway. So then that doesn't impact the overall safety of the vehicle. So I think with these, you've always got to go to caradvice.com, have a look at the story because we'll always explain as best we can with the information we can get why it doesn't have a five-star rating. <laughs> Paul, in more great news for Australian consumers, uh, Subaru released a really, really hot version of the WRX oh, at the Detroit Motor look. Show. And guess what? Not coming what? to Australia. No, I was about to say, when can we buy no, one? No, you can't. 
This thing is cool because EJ25, which is yeah. Subaru's... Two and a half litre. Yep, two and a half litre engine, 254 kilowatts of power. It is a weapon of a thing. Mm. But like you said, not coming to Australia. And look, I'm kind of glad it isn't. I I'm going to be that guy that really? everyone hates. But this thing has been out for a long time. Mm. The EJ25 hasn't really improved that much. And you drive an STI today and there is so much turbo lag compared mm. to even something like a Golf GTI, which I find just more enjoyable to drive. These things can be just hard to get off the line. They're not that sort of entertaining anymore. Yeah. Do you reckon it's about done and dusted for the STI? I think it's a tough one. I mean, if you're of our generation um, or even older than us, something like a WRX or an STI certainly was an aspirational car. You know, these things yeah. back in the 90s and early 2000s, they were all wheel drive. They were super quick, turbocharged. Evo and STI were the ones to get. They were the ones to get and everybody wanted one. And, and you know, the Subaru brand had that cachet. I just don't think they have that anymore. Yeah. I, I think it's problematic for the brand. I don't think they've been able to answer the call as to what they do to change that. Uh, the platform, yeah, I think probably needs a lot of updating. And the big point that you made there, mate, is about the uh, turbo lag. Because what's happened now um, with the way that they engineer these modern engines, we're accustomed to testing turbo engines that don't feel like turbo yeah, engines. Exactly. They just have a really smooth linear power delivery. There's no lag. There's no flat spot. Yeah. And when you go back to what we would call the bad old days of the way turbos used to mm. be, it doesn't feel great to drive, does yeah, it? Absolutely. <laughs> I love comparison tests, mate, and I love this one specifically. You have had a go at me mercilessly in the past for being attracted to cars that I can't fit in. And <laughs> do you know two cars that I have no business being involved in? Well, three, actually. Yep. Hot hatches. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, just no business. Uh, I30N, Renault Megane, Volkswagen Golf GTI has led this segment for how long? Hot hatches have been a staple for people and Australians have been big fans of hot hatches for a long time. Yep. Renault and Volkswagen got in really early, late 70s and started doing their versions of the hot hatches. And here we are decades later, they're still going hammer and tongs at each other and now Hyundai have come in as well. Yeah, exactly. You know when you go to the shops and you're looking for a new outfit or something, I you see this unbelievable deal and you think, oh my God, is that actually the price I have, have to a, buy it? Don't you have a personal shopper? No, mate. Oh, I do. Um, the i30N is that car. Yes. Because if we start on price yep. here, Thirty nine nine ninety. You can't get your head around it. I almost feel like I'm ripping the dealer yeah, off. You can't get your head around yeah, it. Yeah, it then steps up to the uh, Renault Megane RS at forty four nine ninety. Even that's good value. Absolutely. Yeah. And then it caps off at forty five four ninety for the Golf GTI. Yeah. Now I know what you're thinking. Wasn't the Golf GTI sub forty k? I was thinking, why can't he stop talking? <laughs> yeah, it was sub forty k. <laughs> yeah. But it was. Yeah, That's the thing. The it was. Up. It was under 40 grand. Yeah. It's now DSG only. Yeah. The manual is gone. Mm. That in itself, I think, is a travesty because a hot hatch needs a manual, at well, least as an option. This is interesting, isn't it? Because we've spoken a lot about the fact that the i30N is manual only at the moment, yeah. DCT coming. They're working on it. Um, their discussion, the Hyundai discussion, is that they wanted the DCT to be right. Now, that's good because you need they... to get it right before you Exactly, as we know. Yeah. Now, then you're saying golf not available in a manual. Mm. I, I really think, you know, my mindset with these cars is at the moment, while we're still using manual transmissions somewhere in the Mark motoring world, offer them in a manual, yeah. I think. Um, I don't think you necessarily have to buy the manual if you don't want it, but I think yep. it should be offered in a manual. For me, that manual in the i30N is one of the best I've used. It's absolutely not a pain in the neck around town. It's quite smooth. And it's not one of those manual gearboxes or engine combinations that you have to drive hard all the time to get the yep. best out of. You can actually just trundle around town at city speed and it's not too bad. Yeah, and that's the thing. For unskilled drivers, um, you can like actually, me. yes, yep. uh, you could use the rev matching function. So <laughs> it means if you're driving faster, you've found yourself a cool winding road, you can then go through the gears. It will jump up, do the rev match, which means you don't get a clunk. You don't get any, it is so much fun to drive. Mm. Um, and in terms of tech as well, these cars are really well equipped in terms of features and some of the telemetry you can now show on the screen. Yeah. So Renault has uh, the Arlex system in the center of the car that will give you infinite amounts of really cool stats on the car. Mm. Uh, Hyundai has a screen there as well that will let you customize the car as well. Um, it's only the Megane that doesn't offer adaptive suspension. Yeah. Uh, so the Golf GTI and the i30N do, and that's that technology that allows the, the suspension to vary in terms of stiffness. Mm. So if you want comfort around town, yeah. you get it. And if you want to be sporty, it can be a little firmer. On that subject too, I think once again, the Hyundai i30N benefits from the local suspension tune. Yeah, absolutely. It really does. You know, it, it rides and handles incredibly well. And while it sort of errs on the side of firm, as you'd expect these vehicles to, it's actually comfortable. It, yeah. it doesn't bang and crash over every little pothole and cat's eye and, you know, join in the road. 
And I think that's the reality. For me, if I'm buying one of these vehicles, I'm going to track days. I'm, yep. not, I'm not going every week or twice a week yeah, by any means. Go. You want to go. You want to be able to go. You want to be able to yep. access it. However, to get to the track day, you've got to drive this thing Monday to Friday. True. You've got to be stuck in traffic. You've got to be on the motorway, course chip surfaces, all that kind of stuff. And for me, I think that combination from the i30N where it does it really well and then the warranty which is covered, yeah. which covers track day usage as it's long as it's not timed. Yeah. Unheard of in that segment. For me, that's why it tips it just in the balance of the i30N. Yep. And, and that's a point. A lot of the time readers will say, okay, this is the vehicle that won your comparison or won your mega test, but would you actually go out and buy it? Kurt and I were talking about this in the Sydney office. We would both buy the i30N. I'd give my own money for the i30N and I could live yep. with it happily. Yeah, me too. Uh, let's talk about some of the other figures here. So acceleration, which is an important one. You want Big to know factor. who's going to get off the lights quicker. <laughs> I30N, 6.2 seconds, 0 to 100 k's an hour. It has a launch control function, but yep. it's not actually a launch control. It just holds revs. It doesn't sort of manage traction. Yep. Uh, Renault Megane, 5.8 seconds. Yep. So that is That's well quick. and truly the fastest That's fast. Uh, followed by the Golf 6.2 seconds, which recently got a power upgrade as well, so it's quicker. Fuel consumption is interesting because, I mean, they don't really use that much fuel, mm. but it is interesting to note the Hyundai i30N, 8 litres per 100 k's. Okay. Uh, the Renault Megane, 7.5 litres per 100 k's, but yeah. the Golf, 6.5 litres yeah. per 100 k's. It is pretty efficient. I really think, even though we've said in the twin tests that we did, so we actually dethroned the Golf GTI as the best hot hatch mm -hmm. and said the Hyundai i30N is now the best hot hatch for the money in Australia in terms of what it does to the hot hatch brief. However, and this is an interesting caveat because we're still saying the i30N is a better vehicle, but I still think the Golf just pips it in an all-round sense. It might not be you know, quite as engaging, it might not have yep. quite as much grip, might not be as fast outright on a twisty road or a racetrack, but things like the cabin quality, the comfort, um, the ride around town, and that fuel figure is a big deal. Yep. I mean, compared exactly. to the others, that's a significant difference. Um, so I think it's a, it's a really competent all-rounder to live with day to day. But, but I'm not buying a hot hatch to be competent <laughs> and boring. Well, you should I be competent be behind the wheel. No, I want it to be interesting. You do want it to be interesting. Um, the one thing I want to point out here uh, before we reveal who won this comparison, uh, just on the Renault Megane, you get four-wheel steering, yeah. which is really cool technology it is. that allows the car to yeah, do its own it thing. Um, in our review here, uh, Jez, who wrote the review, came up with something interesting. He said that it's just extremely debatable whether Renault's four-wheel steering, also found on the Megane GT, gives the latest RS any greater agility than its predecessor on a mm. twisty road. Interesting. He's described that uh, it turns, the rear wheels turn in opposite direction to the front below 60 kilometres an hour, yep. and then above they turn in the same direction. And then he's finished it off by saying it certainly doesn't help chasing I-30 yet. Mm. Mm. So, so the i30N is still fast regardless yeah, without exactly. the rear wheel steering. So that's an interesting technological uh, development. Our result was really close. So we'll give the result here. Yes. We like sending you to the website to read the story, but we will, we will give you the result. Eight to the Golf, eight out of 10. Eight out of 10, yep. And then a split winner at the top, eight and a half for the Renault and the i30N. That shows how close it is. Yeah. Renault have obviously got the formula right with that vehicle. Yep. We know the i30N is great. Go to caradvice.com, read the full uh, review, the full comparison test, let us know what you think. And what we'd love to hear at advice at caradvice.com is which one would you buy? Paul, I'm gonna make a claim here that viewers are gonna say, no, surely he's full of it. He can't <laughs> mean this. If there was one car, one vehicle that I was gonna buy that I've test driven in the last yep. 18 months, it'd be the one we're just about to talk about. A Ram yep. 1500 pickup, a full-sized American truck that I have no use for, no space for, nowhere to park, and can't justify an argument to buy. That makes two I, would of go, us. I would go out and buy one. <laughs> How good are they? They are so good. And, and I don't know what it is that appeals about these things. You look at it and I genuinely could not ever find a use for it. But <laughs> I want, want one. You just want one. They're <laughs> unbelievable. So viewers all know that Ram Trucks Australia converts 1500, 25 and 3500. Mm. Here we've taken a close look at the 1500 for a really specific reason. It's new to the market, obviously, but what we really like about it is that it's not quite as oversized as a 25 or 3500. There's what they're what they call heavy duty, mm. big, big pickup trucks. This is a little easier to live with and it isn't that much bigger in the overall scheme of things than the dual cab utes we get now. Yep. It's bigger, but it's not super, super sized. Now, 
we were having a chat in the Sydney office, myself and Sam Purcell, who looks after our four-wheel drive content. We we're talking about the ads specifically. You've seen them. Yep. I'm sure the viewers have seen the Ram ads where they say that it eats dual cab utes for breakfast. Clever so marketing clever. campaign, isn't it? it? Yep. So what we've done is we decided to say, well, will it eat a dual cab ute for breakfast? So as you can see in the photo <laughs> there, that's our car advice Mitsubishi Triton on our car advice trailer. <laughs> Around about 2,700 kilos with both of them yep. in there. There's probably a bit of fuel in there, etc., cetera. Um, and a fair bit of dust in our Triton as well because it's been <laughs> off-road right. and I don't know that the camera guys have cleaned it. Um, so the 2,700 kilos is quite a lot. You know, yep. you put that behind a Hilux or a Navara, you can feel it. And in fact, I recently did some toe testing with our company-owned Navara and with about that much behind it, it didn't want to know about it. Yeah. You know, going up long hills on the freeway, didn't want to know about it. So little disclaimer here, nothing wrong with our Triton. Not broken Aside down. Aside from the dust. Aside from the dust, yeah, <laughs> it needs a wash. Nothing wrong with it. It's not broken down. We just wanted to use it as a prop. And the short answer for you, mate, you haven't asked the question yet, but I know you're about to. Okay. Trent, what did it feel like to tow the truck? I told you you were going to ask the question. You didn't even know it was there. You right. actually did not even know it was there. Just cruising around town between 60 and 80 and then up to 100 on yep. the motorway, it made zero difference to what the Ram was doing. Can I put this into context? That Ram may look like an obscenely <laughs> expensive truck. Yeah. It's actually not. $89,000 starting price, Damn. towing capacity of up to four and a half tonnes, mm. and it's powered by a 5.7 litre V8 Hemi engine that makes about 300 kilowatts of yeah. power. Now, the, the thing that I find most surprising is the 1500 has just been updated in the US. So That's they've right. got a brand new interior, really sort of different design. It looks really good. That will eventually come to Australia, but in the US, they're selling the old one alongside the new one That's because it. people are still buying them. Yep. And you jump into this old one, it looks fantastic inside. You still have that Uconnect infotainment system. There are stacks of room in there. You've got heated and cooled seats. Yeah. Uh, you've got the rotary dial selector, which means the conversion's easier to do. Mm. You can comfortably fit five people Easily. in it. It tows like anything, yep. and I have a confession to make. Mm. I thought I broke the one that we had on test, because I took it into a car wash, you know those ones that come yeah. around the, the side of the yeah. car? And the car wash started going through. I wife was in the passenger seat. I looked at her and thought, yeah. I'm gonna we're in trouble, we're just gonna scratch the it's too wide. Yeah. It. Yeah. it fits. So yeah. it fit into our apartment block, yeah. fit into the car wash, yeah. it tows. Yeah. What else more do you want? Well, I think the other thing to, the other thing to mention uh, in terms of the driving of it is the fuel efficiency. Now, yes. Ram claims 9.9 .9 litres per 100 on the highway with no weight. You can probably get to that. It's not yep. a problem. It's got some clever technology that helps there. Cylinder on demand. That's right, so. exactly. But what we saw around town for me was most impressive. So unladen around town in really heavy stop-start traffic, 14 litres per 100. I saw the same thing. Different right. car, but yep. same engine. 14 yep. litres per 100. You drove it in Melbourne. Yep. I drove it in Sydney. That's a real-world figure. And to me, that's really impressive because, you know, you drive an AMG Mercedes-Benz around town. Yeah. It using, it's using more than that. Absolutely. You, you can get them into the yeah. 20s quite Absolutely. easily. Yep. The other thing that was really impressive here, with that 2,700 kilos behind it, in a mix of driving from 60 k's an hour up to 100 on the motorway, 19 litres per 100. Now, there'd be plenty of people that are about to head off around Australia yep. to tow a caravan that's going to weigh with close diesel. to, yeah, with yep. a diesel, and it's going to weigh close to 2,700 kilos. And you won't get 19 litres per 100 out of a diesel 200 yep. series or a diesel Prado or something yep. like that. So these really need to be considered, I think, for buyers who live on the city fringes because yep. they're a little easier to manoeuvre yeah. outside Absolutely. of the city. But if you're going to tow a large trailer or heavy weight regularly, you need to be looking at these American trucks because they actually do the job really easily. Yeah, Trent, you know what is really going to change the market when they finally build one of these as a factory right-hand yeah, drive. Exactly. Heaven forbid a Ford comes to their senses <laughs> and with does the F-150. Yeah. That would sell like hotcakes. Yeah, well, Aluminium body, yeah. it weighs about as much as a Ranger. We've driven so it in the States. It is an epic machine. So uh, we'd love to hear from anyone advice at caradvice.com. Have you bought one of these or one of the full-size trucks? How do you find sort of driving it around? Yeah. Where do you live? Yeah. Let us know because I think I'd be really keen to find out what people are using them for. Absolutely. And the upshot of this test for us is that the Ram is something you can absolutely live with day to day. It's incredibly impressive as a tow vehicle. And the point Paul made earlier is it's beautifully equipped. You know, these are luxury cars in the States. They're default family vehicles. Americans know how to build them. And while we might give them a bit of stick for driving big pickup trucks, these are really, really good things. <laughs> Favourite part of the show for me, Paul, viewer questions. We're getting a bunch of them, so keep them coming in, advice at caradvice.com. The reason I love it is because you guys out there will always think of something that we haven't thought of. Yeah. There's just so many <laughs> different questions you can ask about new cars. It's never ending. And the first one we've got tonight is one exactly like that, a little bit out of left field. Yes, yeah, so this one is from viewer Chris. 
and he said, hello, can you please help me as to whether if I replace my car's ECU chip, uh, do a dyno tune or add performance parts, whether it'll increase the acceleration and driver experience. Says he's driving an October 2018 Audi S3 Cabriolet, very mm. specific, mm. similar to that one up there. Um, and he wants to know what will happen with the warranty. <laughs> well, well, firstly, Chris, yeah. I like your thinking. I like yeah. the idea of taking a very fast Audi yep. and making it very faster. Of course. Yeah, is that logical. A yeah, you can, I don't know. <laughs> I don't care, but you can make it very faster. Um, I love that idea. I like your thinking. However, well, firstly, to answer your question, yes, it will increase acceleration. It'll yeah. be faster. It'll have more punch through the mid range. You know, with modern turbocharged engines, a chip and a dyno tune, you can get all manner of and power out of them. And this engine shared with a whole number of yeah. uh, VAG products. Yeah, so. it's a great motor. There's no doubt about that. So it will increase and improve the driver experience. However, what I tend to think um, is that you don't ever do these kinds of things under warranty because this will void the factory warranty. Yep. And, you know, to be devil's advocate for Audi, they give you a certain product and they warrant that product. They can't warrant it with a bunch of unknown modifications that they're not aware of and they have no control over. So playing devil's advocate for the car company, well, I can understand why they wouldn't warrant it. But for me, Paul, uh, I love modifying cars. I've been doing it my whole life. I rarely ever look at a stock car and think that's perfect and I couldn't improve on it. However, I'd always wait until the warranty had run out. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you could be crazy. Uh, I've got a friend who bought a Holden Director, mm. so limited edition car. Yep. Perfect to just put in the garage with a tarp on it and mm. never touch it. Mm. What did he do? <laughs> he went and supercharged the bejesus out of it. Yeah. Makes like 500 kilowatts yeah. of power. Because it Mate, needed it. What are you yeah. doing? Yeah. You just killed the value of this. So <laughs> anyway, you can do that if you want. Yeah. If you're happy to avoid the warranty and you want to make it quicker, go for it. One thing to keep in mind though is S3 Cabriolet, it's not exactly the most dynamic thing in the world mm. because it doesn't have a roof. Mm. It's kind of like a tin can that yeah. you step on. Yeah. Uh, so adding more power and torque will will probably affect the way that it handles. So keep that in mind. The so. other thing too, we do practice what we preach. So we've got a 70 series Land Cruiser, dual cab ute that we've purchased at Car Advice and we're doing a bunch of mods to it to make it more impressive and you know improve the performance off-road. And we're not doing anything that'll avoid the warranty yep. until the warranty runs out. So for that first three year period, any modifications we make to it, anything we fit to it, will keep the warranty the way it is because we don't want to do that. You know, Toyota's got a specific warranty for that vehicle. And if I'm stuck out the back of Burke in it in 18 months, I want to be covered by a warranty. I don't want Toyota saying, no, we're going to wash our hands of it. Yep. So we practice what we preach. And for now, I probably wouldn't touch that until it's out of warranty. <laughs> Next question is another good one, mate. Um, run flat tyres versus traditional tyres. And it's a question we get asked more and more now because more and more cars either have a temporary spare, which we're not huge fans of, yeah. but it's better than nothing, or no spare at all. Um, you know, we've seen you can, you've got puncture-free tyres on the market. There's all manner of tyres. But we've got a question here about run flats and traditional tyres. So this is a question from David that came in over email. Uh, my wife has a GLC 200 Mercedes, which is only available with run flat tyres, uh, as with most European mm. vehicles. Not quite true, but mm. a lot of them <laughs> are available with that. Um, we feel the car is very stiff and bumpy compared with conventional tyres. That's true. Um, and I also doubt you can buy a run flat tyre to suit the vehicle between Sydney and Adelaide if something was to go wrong. Uh, interested in your comments, RE run flats, can you tell us uh, what European vehicles, if any, are available with a conventional tyre? Mm. Now, the thing to keep in mind here, we say this to everyone, do a 24-hour test drive. Yep. Like, if you do a 24-hour test drive, you'll discover that the car is too firm, which some Mercedes-Benz products are, and you won't buy it. So a run flat tyre will affect the ride and handling of the vehicle, but it's not going to make as big of a difference as you may think. No, and the tyres are getting better than they used to be. Early iterations of run flat tyres had very, very hard sidewalls because, so if you don't know what the sidewall is, it's the part of the tyre that you can see that sits outside the rim. It was really, really stiff because yep. when the tyre went flat, it had to hold the Support weight of the car up, yep. exactly. But the technology with those tyres is getting better and better. And the point you're making is right, is that they don't ride as hard as they used to. Uh, you will find that out though if you do the 24 hour test yep. drive. If you take the vehicle home, drive it on roads that you use regularly, you'll get a feel for what it rides like, won't yep. you? Absolutely. And the other thing to keep in mind as well is the profile of the tyres. Yeah, that's so right. yep. your car's going to have a certain profile and that is the, the, the size of mm. that sidewall effectively. Yep. Um, by increasing that, you're going to make the ride better, yep. but that could also mean having to change the wheels. So there are a number of combinations here you can toy with to make the ride better. But it is worth keeping in mind that if you do deviate from any of the manufacturer recommendations, you could affect the safety systems mm, in the car as absolutely. well. So have a chat to Mercedes-Benz and see what they offer. 
but I don't know that changing away from run flats will really make that big of a difference. The bigger point here too, because our, our viewer there has asked the question about driving between Sydney and Adelaide, I would suggest if you're doing that kind of drive even semi-regularly, yep. you need to buy a car that has a full-size spare or a provision for a full-size spare. Yep. Because, or buy a full-size spare. Or buy a full-size yep. spare to carry with you because there are plenty of remote roads out yeah, there where exactly. you could get stuck. That's all we've got time for again. Run out of time again, mate. Paul, thank you for joining us. Uh, keep those letters coming in, advice at caradvice.com. Oh, are they? <laughs> Didn't you get that letter I sent you via Carrier Pigeon? Yeah, never if you're made... born after 1920, the Right, emails. so keep those emails coming in, <laughs> advice at caradvice.com. We'll see you again next week, same time, 7.30pm Wednesday nights on Your Money.